With Ahsoka out, or soon to be out depending on when I release this video, I thought now would be a great time to revisit my coverage of the greatest military mind in all of Star Wars history. Let's talk the legend of Grand Admiral Thrawn. If you want to skip around, I've included timestamps down in the description. Please enjoy the video. The most recent episode of The Mandalorian, that's chapter 13, The Jedi, name dropped a Star Wars character known as Grand Admiral Thrawn. Although many Star Wars Expanded Universe fans, i.e. fans of things outside of just the movies, are already familiar with Thrawn, the vast majority of Star Wars fans are not. So I thought today it would be fun to examine the character of Thrawn, both where he exists out of universe, why he's important from that perspective, but also the character's lore and what we can expect if he appears in The Mandalorian or another Star Wars TV show or piece of media. So I'm going to structure this video as if I were talking to a very, very patient friend or family member who knew nothing about Thrawn but was interested in the character after hearing his name in the last episode. That being said, I do think this will still be enjoyable if you've got some degree of knowledge about the character or even if you're very familiar. This should be a good recap. So it all starts in the early 90s, 1991 to be exact. And this is an interesting time for Star Wars. 1991 was almost a decade since the last film in the original trilogy, and was almost a decade away from the prequels. So we're in a sort of dark zone where interest in Star Wars is certainly not at an all-time high. However, 1991 saw the publishing of the first part of arguably the greatest Star Wars book series of all time, the Thrawn Trilogy. Book 1 was called Heir to the Empire, and began a really phenomenal story set after the original trilogy as the New Republic, which is led by Luke, Leia, and Han and features many of the characters that we know and love, faces off against Grand Admiral Thrawn himself. Now, Thrawn would die in the final book of the trilogy, The Last Command, but the Thrawn trilogy would serve to kickstart the Star Wars Expanded Universe, with literally hundreds of books, comics, video games, and more consumed by eager Star Wars fans. Now, that's not only because of the Thrawn trilogy, and the Thrawn trilogy was not the first thing in the Star Wars Expanded Universe, but it was a major factor of the revitalized Star Wars interest. So although Thrawn died in The Last Command, he was still one of, if not the, most famous Expanded Universe characters, and would appear in numerous books, many of which told his rise to power or his time with the Empire. I'll talk about what Thrawn did and why he was so popular, the basic background of the character in just a minute, but eventually the Star Wars Expanded Universe as it then existed was decanonized as Disney purchased Lucasfilm in the Star Wars brand and thus Thrawn and his stories were made non-canon i.e. they didn't officially count as part of the universe anymore. Thrawn was brought into the new Star Wars canon as a major antagonist for the final two seasons of Star Wars Rebels the animated TV show and has also been featured in a number of books including a dedicated trilogy which has already been finished and and another trilogy set in the pre-Empire days called Thrawn Ascendancy. Thrawn disappears at the end of Star Wars Rebels, and although it was pretty obvious that a character of his importance alongside Ezra Bridger would not be killed off screen, this is the first canonical mention of him being alive since the finale. So that's Thrawn's out-of-universe persona. What's his lore? How does he work in-universe? What do you need to know about Thrawn should he appear in live action? Well, when it comes to backstory especially, there is a distinction between canon Thrawn and Legends Thrawn, but when it comes to characterization, they're very, very similar. Thrawn is an incredibly dangerous enemy. I would say Thrawn is the most competent enemy in Star Wars history, but though competent, he's not usually cruel like the Emperor. He's not necessarily evil either. Now, depending on who writes Thrawn, there's a bit of wiggle room here, but Timothy Zahn especially, the author who created Heir to the Empire, the Thrawn trilogy, and of course the character himself, has generally written Thrawn as an authoritarian but not someone inherently evil. In the late era of Star Wars Legends and in Star Wars canon books, Thrawn is basically somebody who likes peace and security in the galaxy and he sees the Empire as the best way to achieve those means. Arguably though, that's not Thrawn's most important aspect. His really defining feature is his intelligence and his status as the greatest military strategist in Star Wars history. 
history. Thrawn is nearly unbeatable, and in Star Wars Legends and Canon, I can't think of a single fair fight that he's lost. Thrawn is usually defeated by unexpected happenings, things that he just could not have predicted, or, well, treachery. How is Thrawn so good? Well, he's got incredible analytical skills. He uses evidence and hints in his environment to predict the movement of his enemies in a way that borders on the supernatural. Thrawn's most common method of prediction and the one that is most well known to fans of the character is his use of art. Thrawn will examine the art of a civilization or an individual and use it to figure out aspects of how that person or society operates. He then uses what he learns to take advantage of an enemy in combat. In Heir to the Empire, for example, when fighting a New Republic task force, Thrawn identifies the commander as an Eloman and uses a technique called the Marg Sable because the Eloman species is particularly vulnerable to attacks with an unstructured profile. Thrawn's big thing is that to defeat an enemy, you must know your enemy. Art is one way of doing so, but the character is also incredibly, incredibly observant and perceptive. He's written very much like a Sherlock Holmes character, and there's usually a Watson as well to help us, the reader or viewer, understand what's going on through his mind. There have been various Watson characters throughout Thrawn's expanded universe appearances. I'd say the most famous one, though, would be Captain Pelion, who was Thrawn's second-in-command during the Thrawn trilogy. Thrawn, by the way, is a Chiss, a blue-skinned, red-eyed alien from the Unknown Regions. His full name is Mithra Nuroto, and the fact that he is an alien serving within the Empire shows just how competent and deadly he is. With the Empire in both Legends and Canon being incredibly xenophobic and humanocentric. Thrawn's skills, I would argue, don't just manifest during individual battles, but are even more prominent when it comes to Thrawn waging a war or a campaign against another individual or faction. Thrawn frequently uses feints and traps to move an enemy into position without them even realizing what's going on. Conversely, he usually is able to identify traps as well, so he makes his enemies look very predictable while generally avoiding attacks against him. And I think that gives us a good time now to talk about the Thrawn trilogy, the original campaign, the three books from Star Wars Legends that introduced the character. Now again, those aren't canon, but they are fairly illustrative of even the Thrawn that we know today. So the Thrawn trilogy is all about a war that Grand Admiral Thrawn waged against the New Republic. He sort of takes on the role of a rebel, because there are much fewer Imperials at this time, especially in his fleet, and he's fighting against the vast New Republic. We see things that he does in Book 1 get paid off later on, and he uses really weird technology like cloaking and cloning, things that were forgotten or misunderstood as a way to surprise his enemies. Thrawn, despite having much less forces than the New Republic, essentially cripples them, and he actually outmaneuvers even Admiral Akbar throughout the entire campaign and is ready to deliver a killing blow at the final battle, the Battle of Bilbringi, before he's assassinated by his bodyguard. Later Expanded Universe content would talk about how Thrawn was extremely close to Emperor Palpatine and played a major role in not just the later Thrawn campaign, but in preparing the galaxy for a number of threats. Thrawn created the Empire of the Hand in the Unknown Regions, which was essentially a second smaller empire which could be a buffer against threats from the the outside. Within the Empire of the Hand was a Thrawn clone, and he set up many other contingencies including embedded sleeper agents across the galaxy and more. Thrawn wouldn't come back to life because the clone would be destroyed, but even the mere thought of him returning to the galaxy almost crippled the New Republic, and the events there can be seen in the Thrawn duology. Thrawn was introduced to the Empire as an exiled member of the Chiss Ascendancy, and that's true in Star Wars canon as well. His origin story and its introduction into the Empire is very, very similar. However, recent novels have changed that slightly, with Thrawn not being exiled, but willingly leaving the Chiss and sort of embedding himself in the Empire. A lot of the Thrawn content in canon has been about Thrawn in his years with the Empire, and remember, Thrawn disappeared before even the Battle of Yavin. So whether he will take up a position as a warlord now that the Empire and Palpatine is gone is sort of up in the air. My guess would be probably. We see in the most recent episode of The Mandalorian that the Magistrate is working for him and the Magistrate explicitly is somebody meant to accumulate vast resources. So I think best guess is that Thrawn is building himself back up for a 
another campaign or something similar. Ahsoka is looking for Thrawn because where Thrawn is, Ezra is, or at least she can find out the fate of Ezra, who is the main character from Star Wars Rebels. But my speculation is that Thrawn is also working with Moff Gideon, and if you're interested why, I put out a video on that yesterday detailing all the evidence, and I do think it is fairly likely. But yeah, just to summarize, Thrawn is, if not the, one of the most famous and well-loved characters from the old Star Wars Expanded Universe. He's been re-canonized now for some time, and is pretty similar when it comes to characterization. Thrawn's a Chiss, an alien from the Unknown Regions. He is incredibly, incredibly intelligent. He's arguably, actually, I wouldn't even say arguably, he's easily the greatest military mind in Star Wars history, and I'd say he's the one enemy above all else, perhaps the Emperor excluded, that you would not want to go up against or draw the attention of. The thing about Thrawn too is in Star Wars Legends at least, we see what he can do with limited resources in the Thrawn trilogy and that seems like it will be relevant to the situation he's in currently. Thrawn had, above all else, an exceptional ability to perceive and prepare for future events. It shouldn't be surprising then that he prepared for the one inevitable thing in the universe, his eventual death. His preparation is less surprising when we remember that Thrawn was aware of great threats which would soon challenge the galaxy, threats which he was best positioned to protect against, which we now know to be the Yuuzhan Vong. In the unknown region world of Nirwarn, Thrawn established the Hand of Thrawn, his personal fortress and the headquarters of the Empire of the Hand. Buried deep within that fortress was a Sparti cloning cylinder, a piece of technology that had been key to Mithra Nirodo's near destruction of the New Republic. Inside that cylinder, a nearly mature clone of Thrawn himself. I've talked about the Empire of the Hand in the past. It started out as an extension of the Galactic Empire, but in my mind, transformed to a benevolent force under the vision of Thrawn, meant to face off against threats in the Unknown Region and beyond. When meeting with the High Officers of the Empire of the Hand, Mara Jade learned that they expected the Chiss to return to the galaxy exactly 10 years after his death. They were not aware however that he would return via clone, and the prevailing thought was that he had faked his death aboard the Chimera, and was taking time to evaluate the galaxy's geopolitical makeup in order to decide which faction he should join to prepare for the threats of the future. Luke and Mara's trip to the Hand of Thrawn occurred in 10 ABY, almost exactly 10 years after his death at Bilbringi, explaining the clone's nearly mature state. The two Jedi, who discovered not only the Sparti Cylinder, but also the secret living quarters of the new Thrawn clone had to deal with a major ethical dilemma. What should they do with this defenseless potential Thrawn sitting in front of them? As a bit of background, while this was happening, the New Republic was struggling with an imposter who was claiming to be Thrawn returned to action, somehow surviving his apparent death at Bilbringi. His so-called re-emergence had almost pushed the galaxy into total civil war. So it's very obvious why it would be tempting to prevent a real re-emergence of the Grand Admiral. However, not only had this new Thrawn not actually committed evil and thus had no sin, but the Empire of the Hand makes it pretty clear that Thrawn was only aligned with the Empire because he believed the galaxy could be best unified under Imperial rule, and if he were to return again, it's quite likely that he would actually join the New Republic, the by far dominant force in the galaxy. In the end, Mara and Luke decide to let the clone live. Thrawn's chamber itself is also worth discussing it had perhaps the best collection of information in the galaxy, including an extraordinarily detailed galactic map and a full copy of the Ka Moss document. It had very serious defenses, including backup electrical systems, a voice-activated security system, and an extraordinarily competent pair of sentinel droids, which actually managed to nearly defeat both Mara and Luke combined. The chamber was also within range of Isilamari, making the clone impossible to detect through the force. Unfortunately, during the Jedi's fight with Thrawn's sentinel droids, the wall separating the chamber and a nearby lake is destroyed, and the only way the Jedi can survive drowning is by blowing up the clone apparatus, which then kills the new Thrawn. So Thrawn returning from death apparently was not meant to be, and I say this is unfortunate because I think this is a loss for the galaxy as a whole. Thrawn would have been very, very useful during the Yuuzhan Vong War.
before. He would have understood their culture better than anyone else in the entire galaxy. And I think he would have helped unify the New Republic, allowing for a more competent, quick response. If you've read The New Jedi Order, you know that the Vong were successful largely because of political infighting, which allowed them to gain an early foothold in the galaxy. With Thrawn as a force for good, I don't think this ever would have happened. However, there's also the question of whether a new Thrawn would have been as skilled as the Grand Admiral itself. And this is also something that Luke and Mara discuss. And it really depends on whether he had innate ability or ability gained through experience. Now, the latter can somewhat be imprinted on new clones, but it's not always successful. So, for those who don't know, Grand Admiral Thrawn was a Grand Admiral within the Empire after the death of Palpatine. He waged a massive campaign against the New Republic before dying at the Battle of Bilbringi. His campaign really pushed the New Republic back, he besieged Coruscant, he turned the New Republic against Admiral Akbar, and he won a series of stunning naval victories. However, after his death, the galaxy was forced to deal with the resurgence of Emperor Palpatine, so there wasn't a whole lot of time to dwell on things. However, much, much later, there was a rumor that Grand Admiral Thrawn had not only returned, but rejoined the ranks of the Empire. Unfortunately for the galaxy, given the fact that the Yuuzhan Vong were coming, Thrawn had not in fact returned. He did have a clone of himself which was being prepared, but that was destroyed, and the so-called Thrawn which had rejoined the Empire was in fact an elaborate ruse. With that brief history out of the way, what did people think of arguably the galaxy's greatest ever military mind? Well, that's what we'll be talking about in today's video. And let's touch on that first point very briefly, because it is the most obvious one. When it came to Grand Admiral Thrawn, his enemies feared him, and his allies sometimes doubted him before being awed by him. Grand Admiral Thrawn predicted things in a way that seemed completely crazy to the ordinary person. He would make assumptions and move forces in seemingly illogical ways, but his gambles nearly always paid off. This did sometimes lead to, within the Empire, a bit of friction. He would move forces away from what appeared to be an obvious target, he would be chastised by someone like Captain Pelion, but in the end, his hunches would almost always turn out to be correct. So despite being an alien, most people who worked with Thrawn eventually would develop a grudging respect at the very least for him. What's more, he was known to be a very fair leader. Although he was not against executing someone for the most terrible of mistakes, Thrawn would not kill somebody for making a simple error which they didn't have the chance to fix, nor would he kill somebody if they failed not due to their own fault, unlike, say, Darth Vader. Throughout the campaign especially, he did a great job at winning the hearts and minds of those serving within his fleet, and I think that that is fairly notable. Imperial rivals, i.e. those within the Empire but who didn't work with Thrawn, would have displayed, especially before Thrawn was sent to the Unknown Regions to begin his work on the Empire of the Hand, there would have been a lot of jealousy and competitiveness. But certainly there was a group of people who disliked Thrawn even more, and that would have been the people that he fought against. Thrawn was so good at high-level strategy, including things like fleet movements, that he was seen by some as almost omniscient. Thrawn played into this really heavily, although he was seen as a master war strategist, a big part of how Thrawn operated was sowing deception within the ranks of his enemies. He would leave certain individuals alive after battle, just knowing that they would pass on a specific message message, which would then cause confusion. Specifically, he would target high-ranking members within his opposing forces command structure and try to turn them against each other, as he did with Borsk Falia and Admiral Akbar. He also used intelligence, so he could even better predict the movement of his enemies, which in the New Republic's case almost made the government fall apart believing that there was some sort of inside source within a high level. Again, this is all very well detailed throughout the Thrawn trilogy, but I think it's more interesting to actually look at how Thrawn was treated after the war, after he was killed by Rook at the Battle of Bilbringi. The best place that we get really concrete information about that, unsurprisingly, is the Thrawn duology. Two books, Spectre of the Past and Vision of the Future, which serve as a spiritual successor to the trilogy. On one hand, almost a decade later, Pelion still regrets the death of Thrawn, and thinks about how he was probably the only individual who could have brought the Empire back from their current situation. When it comes to, say, the New Republic, the first time Leia sees Thrawn's name in a data 
a card stating the hand of Thrawn, she's literally almost knocked out just by how stunned she is. As Deesera and the other Imperials are creating a scheme to make it seem like Thrawn has come back alive, the galaxy is really unsure what to think. Thrawn's death at Bilbringi was very, very well known, but everyone also understood just how ingenious Thrawn was, and people were willing to believe that he'd either faked his death, had someone standing in for him, or prepared a clone, the latter of which would turn out to be right. Still, as he reappeared amongst Imperials, pretty much everyone that saw him was shocked, even the most well-trained stormtroopers. The same is true when Lando meets the imposter, he's just completely stunned, and it's almost like Thrawn returning would be worse than Palpatine coming back for a third time. And this wasn't only true for individuals, but galaxy-wide. Thrawn's supposed return was swaying planets to join the Imperial Remnant and destabilizing the New Republic. Again, you can read more about this in the Thrawn duology, which I very highly recommend, but the reappearance of the Grand Admiral combined with the Ka Maz Crisis is basically the closest the New Republic came to a full-scale civil war, and there wasn't even a shot fired by the Imperial Remnant. The fear also caused a lot of denial, and you can read more about that after Lando returns and as the New Republic decides what to do with his information. But let's move on, and I would say the galaxy's perception of Thrawn changed fairly significantly after the Yuuzhan Vong invasion. In the final stages of the Ka Maz Crisis, Luke and Mara Jade were warned that there was an oncoming threat, and that Grand Admiral Thrawn was not a true Imperial at heart, but rather cared about the safety of the galaxy. He had been creating a first line of defense in the unknown region called the Empire of the Hand. Of course, that mysterious force would come to be known as the Yuuzhan Vong. And I am sure when they invaded the galaxy, many wished that Thrawn had been around to unify the militaries against the massive threat. I think the best perspective of public opinion we get for this time is from the Essential Guide to Warfare, and a mini excerpt of of course a fictional article called Myth Ron Rota Reconsidered, a Patriot's Perspective by Lenang Opali, and it's sort of a Thrawnist imperialist apology piece. But through implication, we can learn not only what the author is trying to argue, but also what the general public thinks of Thrawn. First of all, we know that Thrawn's connection with Palpatine early on and his efforts against the first waves of the Yuuzhan Vong were known by the public, or at least those educated within the public, as were his efforts against other factions like the Sea Ruvi. But still, given the fact that the New Republic was ultimately successful and the New Republic transitioned into the GA, which remained the dominant power, it does seem obvious that there was still a lot of resentment against Thrawn and that despite his efforts against the Yuuzhan Vong, he was seen as an Imperial who tried to overthrow the New Republic, albeit a genius one at that. In reality, that is partially true, Thrawn was trying to overthrow the New Republic, but that's only because he believed a unified empire would be the best defense against the galaxy. Now, I don't think this is because, as presented by the author, that it was because the New Republic style of government wouldn't work against an invasion, but rather because he believed the current structure of the empire allowed for a better defense. That article is interesting too because it presents several other what I'll call conspiracy theories, including the fact that the second Death Star was actually meant as a weapon against the Yuuzhan Vong, which is not true. It would have been a good weapon, but that's not why it was created. I've done a whole video on that. And also, that Thrawn himself was preparing the galaxy for the Emperor's eventual return. And that's why Thrawn's invasion and later Operation Shadowhand coincided so neatly. From what we know in both Vision of the Future and the Dark Empire source book that is not true, Palpatine got involved after Grand Admiral Thrawn's invasion because he saw the galaxy in tatters. So the sort of apologist Imperial perspective here doesn't really hold water unsurprisingly, but I do think it's a very interesting look at the conspiracy theories that would have surrounded Grand Admiral Thrawn and the fact that he would have remained a very, very contentious figure even among those in the know. And we know that from Luke and Mara directly when they're contemplating the loss of his clone in Vision of the Future. So today we have what I consider to be a fascinating video topic because we're talking about two of my favorite characters in Star Wars. But we have to start from the beginning. So before I answer the question of today's video, I'm gonna give an extremely shortened history of Thrawn and Palpatine's relationship. 
The two first met before the Clone Wars, during the outbound flight expedition. At that time, Thrawn was still part of the Chiss, and Palpatine was the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic. By explaining that the outbound flight could anger the Yuuzhan Vong and start an invasion, Palpatine convinced Thrawn to strike out and disable the outbound flight. Mithra Nuroto agreed to do so, and ended up greatly impressing the Chancellor with his tactical and strategic mind. After this event, Thrawn yearned to join the Empire, and would eventually force the Chiss to exile him through his continued push of his philosophy of preemptive strikes. Of course, there's a lot more nuance to this. Thrawn didn't necessarily respect the ideology of the Empire, and he still cared about the Chiss ascendancy, but we'll cover that some other day. Anyway, during his exile, Thrawn made his way to the Empire, cleverly securing a position within the Imperial Navy. There, he would further develop his relationship with Palpatine and climb through the military ranks quickly. However, because he was an alien from the Unknown Regions, many within the Imperial elite did not accept Thrawn's growing influence and pushed for Palpatine to move the Chiss to a less prominent position in the Outer Rim or beyond. By this point, Thrawn had not only earned the exclusive rank of Grand Admiral, but also the even more rare rank of Warlord, giving him not only military but also civil control over vast portions of space. In the guise of appeasing the alien's detractors, Palpatine moved Thrawn to the Unknown Regions. In reality, Palpatine was not at all worried about military politics. Thrawn was moved out of charted space to establish the Empire of the Hand, an arm of the Empire meant to pacify and consolidate the Unknown Regions. This would not only extend the influence of the Empire, but also create a first buffering line of defense against the extragalactic Yuuzhan Vong. While still totally part of the Empire, the Empire of the Hand was a distinct quasi-government with its own doctrines and military style. In many ways, the Empire of the Hand was more militarily sound, using a combination of Chiss and Imperial practices. But more on that as well on a different day. During Thrawn's strategic exile to the Unknown Regions, the Rebel threat continued to grow in the galaxy. This would of course lead to the Battle of Endor and the first death of the Emperor. Now, neither of these events would spell the final end of Sidious or the Empire as a whole, and five years later, Thrawn would return and wage a devastating campaign against the Republic. Although he almost managed to reinstate the Empire, Thrawn would die during the final battle after being betrayed by his bodyguard Rook. In the end, although Thrawn did stop some infighting among warlords and he consolidated power, the only benefit the Empire as a whole would gain from his campaign is some extra territory. While the Empire lived on through Thrawn and other warlords, Palpatine also returned to life, his spirit inhabiting a reborn clone body. He would remain silent through the Thrawn campaign, only re-emerging to lead the Dark Empire after the Chiss's defeat. The question is thus, why did he wait? The New Republic was already overwhelmed by Thrawn's offensive. Had Palpatine and Mithra Nerodo struck together, they could have easily seized control of the galaxy. We get some insights into the thoughts and megalomania of Palpatine in the Dark Empire sourcebook. I'm going to read two quotes. His forces had failed him, and the price for failure was what it had always been, death. As years passed and he grew stronger, he began to concentrate more on his dark side studies. Still, he did grow occasionally concerned when one leader or another would come close to silencing the others and claiming the throne. When his servant Thrawn made his claim, Palpatine could only watch in sadness. He had hoped Thrawn would know better. It was heartening to see how effectively Thrawn dealt with the cruel hand fate had dealt him. A lesser person would have despaired, but a lesser person would never have been chosen as a Grand Admiral in the first place. Still, no contender could be allowed to become too powerful. It was no accident when Thrawn fell. Then later, Palpatine never knew if Thrawn guessed that he was being used to divert attention from his own return. So this presents us with not only Palpatine's thoughts, but his reasons for not intervening. It's clear that in Legends, like in the new canon, Palpatine believed that the Empire was not an organization, but a manifestation of the Emperor himself. The Emperor is thus the only one fit to lead it, which is why he despairs that Thrawn tries to take up the mantle as a quasi-Emperor himself. He was simultaneously impressed, once again, by the skills of Thrawn, but disappointed that he didn't either believe that the Emperor was coming back or wanted to strike out on his own. Palpatine also used the chaos created by the Thrawn campaign to further grow his forces and prepare for Operation Shadow Hand. It's not surprising then that less than a year after 
after Thrawn's death, the Dark Empire launched a massive assault on the New Republic, taking even the planet Coruscant. Still, it's interesting to think of a scenario where Thrawn and Palpatine were both active at the same time. I wonder whether Mithrod Naroda would have fallen in line behind the Reborn Emperor. The Dark Empire was a more sinister force than even the initial Galactic Empire. We know that some Imperials did find out about Palpatine's rebirth and fled to him, but this knowledge was likely unavailable to someone like Thrawn, who was waiting in the Unknown Regions. Since Star Wars Rebels, we've known that the TIE Defender program was the brainchild creation and one of the main projects of Grand Admiral Thrawn. We also know that Imperial funding was heavily split between the TIE Defender project and the Death Star, and that Krennic, Thrawn, and Tarkin were all trying to fight for pretty much the same resources. This is elaborated on even further in Thrawn Alliances, where we learn that Thrawn basically wanted construction of the Death Star halted, with further funding placed entirely in the TIE Defender program. And I mean, that matches what we know about Mithra Naroto. In the first book, we learn that he much prefers smaller, mobile vessels, and that something like the Death Star is just too inflexible and too large of a target. So let's say that Palpatine, who recognized that Thrawn was perhaps the greatest military mind in the Empire, had listened to his advice, instead of capitulating to the wishes of Tarkin, Krennic, and others. In my opinion, Thrawn would have completely halted any construction of the Death Star and instead poured all resources into expanding and furthering the TIE Defender project. I don't think he ever would have completely phased out TIE Fighters from service, but I think TIE Defenders would have became a common part of every Imperial fleet. What are the immediate ramifications of this? Well, there are many. First of all, the destruction of Alderaan forced many systems and even Imperials to leave the Empire and support the Rebel Alliance. The Death Star itself was also destroyed, representing a true waste of resources, and more than just material material and things, we learn in the Inferno Squad novel that many of the best of the best within the Empire were actually stationed on the Death Star, and that its destruction caused somewhat of a void in the Empire's military leadership. On top of that, it was one of the first major victories of the Rebel Alliance, and created a huge boost in morale, and of course, more joining the Rebel cause. With the TIE Defender program, sure, there could be serious setbacks, like the destruction of the Lothal Fuel Depot, but there's no reason why you couldn't have outsourced TIE Defender construction to various shipyards across the galaxy. And if we use the Legends cost of a TIE Defender, the Empire could have built over 3 million individual starfighters, which, by the way, represents represents more than 100 for every Star Destroyer. The Alliance's main advantage throughout the Galactic Civil War was that their fleet was super mobile, and that their starfighters easily outclassed the TIE fighters used by the Empire. The Defender program would have put the two sides on equal footing, especially if you loaded every Star Destroyer with at least a squadron of them. That the Death Star 1, you also don't have the Death Star 2, which saw the death of Palpatine, and of course the fracturing, then crumbling of the Empire. But even if you did have the Battle of Endor in some capacity, TIE Defenders would have made a fairly significant difference. This is another example where Thrawn was just right. The Empire was already big, hulking, and powerful. They needed speed and flexibility to fully counter the Rebels. A completely funded TIE Defender program would have eliminated any advantages faced by the Rebel Alliance, while also removing the many gains the Alliance received after the destruction of Alderaan and the first Death Star. We'll be taking Canon Thrawn and Legends Thrawn and putting them in a situation as similar as possible to the sequel trilogy with the First Order emerging. Now, there will be a bit of weirdness when we deal with Legends because we've got to keep Thrawn's motivations and his motivations necessarily differ if the universe he's in differs, but we'll address that when we get to it. First off, let's start with canon, and as we've learned in the first two books of the new canon Thrawn series, Myth Ra Nerodo ultimately joined the Empire because, above all, he valued its strength and saw it as the most powerful force available to contest the greater threats lurking within and perhaps outside the galaxy. Now, arguably his Legends character takes this to a whole nother level, and the old Thrawn basically thought that a non-unified galaxy, even with both the Empire and the New Republic, would be
be destroyed by some coming threat. However, even in canon, where the threats are more abstract, although the Empire was far, far from perfect and was ultimately mostly a tool to further Palpatine's power, from Thrawn's point of view, it was the only organization in existence which actually had the capability to secure the galaxy. It seems like Thrawn was largely worried about some threat facing the Chiss. And here's a quote from the first new canon Thrawn novel. What exactly do you wish from my empire? Palpatine asks. A state of mutual gain. I offer my knowledge and skill to you now in exchange for your consideration to my people in the future. And when that future comes, what if I refuse to grant that consideration? Then I will have gambled and lost. Ron said calmly, but I have until that time to convince you that my goals and yours do indeed coincide. Canon Thrawn is very, very protective of the Chiss people, and Thrawn alliances actually outright suggests that his alliance is primarily to the Chiss themselves. However, even as far back as the first book, when providing the Emperor with knowledge of the unknown regions, Mithra Nirodo would always leave out important Chiss military secrets. So now that we know Canon Thrawn's motivations for joining the Empire, and thus presumably joining other factions, let's now examine how this plays into the sequel trilogy, and I think the main issue is basically whether the First Order would actually be the best for the Chiss, and I guess the galaxy at large, although I think Canon Thrawn puts that at a pretty far secondary. The major mystery is that we don't know what threats remain unaccounted for, if there's some existential threat in the unknown regions or outside the galaxy that threatens to wipe out the Chiss and everyone else, then perhaps Thrawn does side with the First Order. However, without that situation, I think it's fairly unlikely. Let's talk about the rise of the First Order after the fall of the Empire. Basically, after Jakku, certain elements of the Empire, actually using navigation navigational data from Thrawn himself, by the way, retreated into the unknown regions and grew as sort of a quasi-state. We know that they had run-ins with various unknown region factions and destroyed them. We also know that they exploited planets and populations, and based on that, I would suggest that there's a very decent chance that the First Order, while growing, actually has already had a run-in with the Chess. The First Order used many hidden shipyards, they created super weapons and entire fleets. They needed a lot of space. I don't think Thrawn would see the First Order being present in the Unknown Regions as within the Chiss's best interest. Even if they haven't already had some sort of run-in, I think the First Order represents an existential threat to Thrawn's people. This is especially true if we're talking pre-Starkiller base when the invasion was actually underway. It's also very possible that Snoke, some of the Empire's hidden fleets, or something else that's in the First Order right now was a part of the general threat he spoke of decades earlier. But there's more. Although Canon Thrawn isn't a bleeding heart, he didn't approve of needless civilian casualties. I don't think he would have appreciated the First Order's use of super weapons like Starkiller Base, especially given the fact that Palpatine only justified the use of the super weapon through the Tarkin Doctrine. Because the First Order is a small faction not in power, aside from the initial attack, I don't think super weapons, including the Supremacy, can be justified justified from a tactical perspective, and I don't think Thrawn would like working in a military which is to a degree ideologically opposed to his preferred military strategy. He did it with the Empire, but Palpatine also promised that the Death Star would never be used against the Chiss, and I don't think the First Order would be willing to do the same thing. But there's even more. Thrawn didn't approve of emotional outbursts or violent leaders like Vader. I think he would find it extremely frustrating working with a faction primarily driven by their hate, led by leaders who themselves are emotional, while leading a military manned by those lacking the military experience of those Thrawn is used to commanding. So would Canon Thrawn join the First Order? Probably not. I think he would see it as as large a threat as anything else in the Unknown Regions and would prefer to help fight the threat as part of the Resistance or the New Republic. But let's now move to Legends, and I think instead of doing a full second analysis, we should instead look to the differences between the two versions of Thrawn. I would argue that both versions of Thrawn are not dedicated to the Empire, but in Legends, his loyalties were even more, well, tenuous at best. 
success. Not only does he place at a high value the well-being of his people, but the well-being of the galaxy generally. And we know that Thrawn did intend to return, in the clone version at least, even after his death, but that there was a very real chance, if not a certainty, that the cloned Thrawn would have allied his new empire of the hand with the new republic rather than the Imperial Remnant, as the former was now a dominant, well-organized, non-xenophobic military force. Thrawn in Legends partners above all else with the powerful, which is why he ultimately chose to serve the Empire. Remember, despite the terrible aspects of the machine Palpatine created, it did help to spread order and strength. Here's a quote from Vision of the Future. Park sighed, because everything we've done here, everything we have here, really belongs to Thrawn. And at this point, we frankly don't know which side of your conflict he's going to come down on. Mara blinked. Excuse me, an Imperial Grand Admiral, and you don't know which side he's going to take? The Empire has been whittled down to eight sectors, Fel reminded her. Militarily, they're no longer a power even worth considering. That really shows that Thrawn's ties to the Empire were not ideological, but again, just to reiterate, based on comparative strength. And we do know in Legends that the threat approaching the galaxy, although not explicitly named in Vision of the Future, is the Yuuzhan Vong. A threat which Legends Thrawn says even the New Republic at its full power combined with the Empire may not be able to withstand, certainly not without his help. So let's take this into the scenario, and we'll have to assume that Thrawn is still motivated by some great threat, because that's really the defining aspect of his character. And if we look at Legends Thrawn taken into canon, I do think he is forced to side with the First Order. Not only is the New Republic essentially demilitarized, but the First Order is in the best position to seize power. They've got many ships, they've got control of the Unknown Region, which will necessarily be a buffer between any invading force, and they're about to wipe out and fracture what does remain of the New Republic. I think Thrawn would want to get in there as early as possible, and make sure that the First Order is able to secure the galaxy and prepare it for any oncoming threats. As mentioned, I would prefer not to have to bring the Yuuzhan Vong into this analysis because canon is so different with the politics of the galaxy, but we don't know a whole lot else about what drives Thrawn as a character, so I think that makes his decision to join the First Order rather self-evident. Vision of the Future revealed a side of Myth Ra Nerodo not seen in the Thrawn trilogy. Although during his campaign he seemed like nothing more than a loyal servant of the Emperor, we learn that he was actually far more than that. In fact, post Endor, his ultimate goal wasn't to avenge the loss of Palpatine, Vader, the Death Star, and Imperial High Command, rather he was preparing the galaxy for a major threat. In 19 ABY, Mara Jade was the first of the New Republic to make contact with the Empire of the Hand. The Empire of the Hand was a massive government organization set up in the Unknown Regions by Grand Admiral Thrawn. At the time of its discovery, it controlled at least 10 times more space than the Imperial Remnant, with few full colonies but many shipyards, fortress worlds, training centers, and bases. The Empire of the Hand was first a joint venture between Thrawn and Emperor Palpatine during the Imperial Era. However, while Palpatine's goal may have been to set up a secondary government in the Unknown Regions, Thrawn was preparing for something much different. Again, in Vision of the Future, we learn that he was preparing for something terrible. Some sort of test, which the galaxy would need to unify against to survive. This wasn't an Imperial-only project. That much was obvious by the recruiting of Suntir Fell, who had left the Empire and joined the New Republic. It's also obvious because in 19 ABY, when rumors of Thrawn's resurrection were abound, the Empire of the Hand wasn't sure whether he would join the New Republic or the Imperial Remnant. So, his his real purpose for fighting the New Republic was to create one unified government. He came at it from the Imperial side because he had more Imperial resources at his disposal and he thought the Empire was already more militarized. But this threat was so deadly that had he returned in 19 ABY, he likely would have defected instead to the New Republic, which was by far the dominant force at that time. There's also the fact that much of the Empire was too tied up in old xenophobic ideas and seemed to be a bit too interested in protecting only 
only themselves. Thrawn, on the other hand, was interested in protecting the galaxy. What was this major threat though? What was he so scared of? Thrawn at one point said that even with the full might of the Empire and New Republic combined under his command, the galaxy might still end up losing. Stent, one of the Chiss within the Empire of the Hand, explains to Mara Jade that there are so many threats within the Unknown region ready to strike at the galaxy, but there's something more than that. Voss Park, a high-ranking member of the Empire of the Hand and the Imperial who actually brought Thrawn to the Emperor, tells Mara that there's a singular dark force so deadly that he's sure it will convince her to join their faction. The force isn't named, but it's almost certainly the Yuuzhan Vong. The Yuuzhan Vong were an extragalactic race prepared to invade the Star Wars galaxy. Thrawn had been aware of the existence of the Yuuzhan Vong since the outbound flight incident and had likely been ascending with in the Imperial hierarchy because he believed the militarized faction was the galaxy's best hope. It's no surprise then that he, together with Palpatine, established the Empire of the Hand in the Unknown Regions as sort of a first buffer against the alien invaders. As I said, the Yuuzhan Vong are never mentioned by name within the book, but it should be noted that Vision of the Future came out a year before Vector Prime, which kicked off the New Jedi Order. Timothy Zahn has also confirmed that Lucasfilm had approved the idea of a galactic invader by the time of his writing of Vision of the Future, and that's what he was referring to by the threats from the Empire of the Hand. Grand Admiral Thrawn was easily the greatest military mind in Star Wars history. He brought the much more powerful New Republic to its knees through a combination of determination, genius military planning, and unbeatable tactics. Today we'll be looking at the tactics and strategies used by Grand Admiral Thrawn and applying them to Empire at War. Not only showing you guys how the tactician worked in Star Wars Legends, but also making you a better Empire at War player. With that being said, I've separated this video into different sections for each strategy and tactic, and I've included time codes to each one down in the description. You might be familiar with some of them already, but generally, I think this video will make you guys better players and will be interesting overall. With that being said, let's get started. Alright, so the first technique is one that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, even if you don't know it by its name. We're talking first about the Thrawn Pincer. Now, we covered a variant of this strategy in my last sort of Star Wars Empire at War tutorial video, but right now I want to look specifically at how Thrawn pioneered this very interesting technique. Now, in the expanded universe, in the actual books, he needed to use an interdictor star destroyer. We don't need to here. Basically, the general principle was that you can't precisely jump in a specific ship in the middle of battle in a way that'll be, you know, right where you expect it to be. You might want to call a Victory Star Destroyer here, but it might end up over here. It might be hundreds of kilometers away. So what Thrawn did is he had his Interdictor Star Destroyers generate a gravity well, basically a cone of artificial gravity, and he would use that to precisely call in his capital ships. Essentially, he forced them out of hyperspace in a way that would be tactically advantageous. We don't need to do that in Empire War, but we can still follow the basic principles. Thrawn liked to do this with Victory Star Destroyers, probably because they were fairly mobile. They weren't as important as Imperial Star Destroyers, so they didn't need to be on the battle the entire time. And they could output a lot of firepower right away. He used Victory Star Destroyers like this at the Battle of Coruscant, for example. So, let's take this Victory, for example. It's locked in on this Dreadnought-class heavy cruiser, another very common Thrawn era warship, and once it's sort of finally honed in on its target, you call the Victory Star Destroyer in at extreme close range. And then you just broadside it. You've probably given some relief for your Dreadnought, which can fly away, and you've got the upper hand now in a battle. Usually, you don't want to go in with just one ship though, Bring in another Star Destroyer. And this is a practice that's very common in Empire at War, but just the general principle of surprising your enemy, bringing in ships where they don't expect it, works really well. This is doubly the case where a ship is out of position, like this Assault Frigate. If we drop a Star Destroyer here, I mean, obviously it's an Assault Frigate, so it's at a disadvantage naturally, but we're also hitting it with our full broadside, um, and it can't really respond meaningfully. 
We did a whole video on this again earlier this week So if you want to see this expanded and how it can be brought to fleet action I'll try to remember to put a link in the upper right hand corner, but this one's pretty simple. Let's move on All right, we're at the galactic map now because instead of looking at specific battle tactics I want to talk about Thrawn's general strategy so Grand Admiral Thrawn was of course representing the Empire, but he wasn't fighting a traditional war against the New Republic. As I mentioned in the intro, he had much fewer resources than the New Republic, much less ships, almost no territory because of the Imperial Warlords still fighting. So instead of just fighting a traditional war where he would slug it out in the battlefield, he really used rebel tactics, hit and fade runs, um, hitting soft targets when they weren't properly defended. And this is a strategy that you can really abuse in Empire at War, especially when playing a me medium level AI or even a hard AI without something like Cruel AI in Thrawn's Revenge. So what we're talking about here is taking a small detachment of ships. Right now we've got a medium sized fleet, three Star Destroyers, I think. Um, but still, we've got most of our um, assets where they need to be to defend um, whatever sector of the galaxy or achieve whatever objective that we have generally. But we also have the planet of Kuat. This is a major shipbuilding world. It's uh, got a dreadnought shipyard, so that represents a lot of assets. And we can go in there. We don't need to win a battle. We just need to destroy the shipyard. And um, that's something Thrawn did all the time. He would go in, um, sometimes attack multiple places at the same time, which he would use battle meditation to do. Um, from Joris Sabayoth. You don't really need that in Empire at War. Um, but there's always an objective behind an objective, really. Whether it's moving the enemy out of position, or in this case, just getting in, destroying the shipyard, and not really caring about what happens in the greater battle. Because if we can take out this little four shipyard in this part of the galaxy, there's not really another source for New Republic capital ships. So this is kind of similar to what we did last time. We can spring the bait if we want. Right. Um, imagine there being a larger defensive force, I guess. It would make it a little more interesting, but this should be fine just to show, um, I guess the general strategy. Even if there were 10 Star Destroyers here and we couldn't get past them, we don't need to. All we need to do is survive long enough to destroy this shipyard. So it is a bit more difficult now because they've increased, at least in the Thrawn's Revenge mod, it's different for each mod, they've decreased the zone around stations um, at which you can't uh, jump into hyperspace, which kind of makes sense, but it makes this technique a little more difficult. If you are sure. But still, these are stations that are meant to be protected. You can take advantage of AI behavior and kind of the weird, the weird way the AI works. Plus, especially when you're playing with the Empire, the massive amount of damage you can deal out quickly to uh, take out targets like this and get out pretty cleanly. And again, don't have to use that many resources. We're talking three Star Destroyers here to um, take out a very important asset. And even if there was a larger defensive fleet, this strategy is still very possible. You just gotta be quick. Um, and sometimes you gotta trick the AI into thinking you're attacking them uh, in a more traditional sense. Maybe call more ships in back here. They, they, uh, or let the fleet get closer. It's uh, I am it's all a bit of a gamble, I guess. Out of Draw their fire. Um, Star Destroyers attack. work really well for this, but there are definitely better ships. A victory or a pack of victories might even be better or very small and fast ships. Um, but this is what we had on hand. So I thought I'd show you guys with this and it's done. So we can retreat now, we'll be fine. Ships have taken hardly any damage. Um, that fleet is out of position. We can go. And again, we don't need to worry about these defending ships. We're more concerned about just destroying the asset and leaving. Part of that too plays into intelligence. Um, Grand Admiral Thrawn in the Thrawn trilogy relied heavily on things like spies. He had a source within the Imperial Palace. He understood how the New Republic operated, how they'd be moving their ships. Um, and you can take advantage of that too in Empire at War. You can bring a massive fleet at, say, Fairfin here, and the AI will respond by moving ships to Coruscant. Then you hit Kuat. Now they've got no shipbuilding in this territory, um, besides down for Fondor. And 
you can get that intelligence. You can actually see where ships are by building things like probe droids. Where are they at? In this menu. Oh yeah, right here. So 30 for 30 credits, you can essentially monitor the movement um, of all ships in nearby systems. So if you wanted to attack Coruscant, for example, which I don't, I never want to fight a battle over Coruscant because I always anticipate them having a cannon on the ground. You get in there, um, well, it's undefended. You destroy the space station and you leave. Then if you need to, you can come back later. Or with Kuat, you don't want to fight it there. Well, they've got that level four um, shipyard facility because it will be pumping out those MC-80Bs. So take advantage of the intelligence, strike where they're weakest. It all seems like common sense, but there's ways that you can do it in Empire at War to sort of maximize your effectiveness. So one final thing I wanted to mention before we go on to the next topic, the Essential Guide to Warfare talks about how Thrawn's strategy of using a relatively small but very mobile fleet allowed him to really shore up and defend the key planets that he did have. And that's one thing I really like doing in Empire at War. I like establishing certain choke points, like for example, if you hold Bill Bringy, then basically all of this sector of space, if you also hold uh, Merker, is protected. You hold two planets, you put massive fleets here, and then even if you don't have that many ships, you can use them as a roving fleet to hit the enemy where they don't want to be hit while not sacrificing your overall defensive position. But let's continue. All right, so now I want to talk about fleet composition and fleet positioning. And we get a lot about composition in the Thrawn trilogy, but not as much about actual positioning. So much of what I'll talk about in that respect comes from other source books like the Imperial source book and later Rebel Alliance source books. So just keep that in mind. So when it comes to fleet composition, Grand Admiral Thrawn was pretty radical, especially when compared to the Empire. Now, in theory, the Empire did have a ratio of Star Destroyers to support ships that they were supposed to maintain, but practically that didn't really happen. Grand Admiral Thrawn, however, was not all talk in that respect. We see at the Battle of Bilbringi that Star Destroyers were not the dominant ship at that battle. I mean, together they did have the most firepower, but there was pretty much one Dreadnought class heavy cruiser for every Star Destroyer. What's more though, he also used support ships like the Lorinar Strike Cruiser we have here um, and the uh, Lancer Frigate that we have there to pretty great effectiveness actually. And the Essential Guide to Warfare actually talks about how the Lancer, which was underused by other factions, actually saw a lot of success under Grand Admiral Thrawn. And I mean, it's pretty obvious why. Star Destroyers alone don't have a lot in the way of anti-fighter, but they do a lot of good things like the turbo laser damage is really exceptional, especially when compared to other New Republic ships of similar sizes. The uh, the Strike Cruiser and the Dreadnought, and even um, to a point the Carrick, also are really focused on that anti-capital ship role, but are quite flexible. And same with the Victory Star Destroyer, which was another favorite of his. So when it comes to positioning, though, we learn from the Thrawn trilogy that most of the space battles between Thrawn and the New Republic, the big ones anyway, especially Bill Bringy, were fought with both fleets in a line formation, and the goal was really to break that line. So it's kind of a catch-22 when it comes to corvettes and smaller ships. You want them to be nearby to the larger ships so that they can help screen from fighters, but you don't want them the main target for enemy capital ships because then they'll get annihilated with a couple of turbo laser volleys. And that was one of the issues that the Lancer had, but there's really no answer to that. You've got to kind of make your estimation of where they can sit and be protected, um, while also, you know, doing their job. Thrawn was also pretty aggressive with fighters, but again, he didn't... It seems like in these larger scale battles, he wasn't moving around his fleets a lot. His Star Destroyers were, solo, were sort of holding position offering overlapping fields of fire. Um, so let's just see how this plays out here. Go ahead and engage these TIE fighters. He was usually pretty aggressive with his fighters. Uh, we're being attacked from behind by the Hapen, so that will mess up this example a little bit. Um, but Thrawn also typically used redundant interdictors. I think at the Battle of Bilbringi, he had like eight or something. 
that's probably a bit excessive. You don't need to do something like that for Empire War. But it's always helpful to have at least one in reserve, um, especially when fighting. Um, later on in the game, some of the factions will get very Corvette heavy, and it'll be really annoying to uh, chase them down, especially in something like uh, Awakening of the Rebellion. So you always want to have at least one interdictor, but if I'm doing something with a very large fleet or I anticipate like a full scale battle, like a scrum, I will uh, try to have a redundant one uh, available on call at least if possible. Let's finish him. So yeah, basic line formation, it looks nice. Um, you're using the main benefits of the Star Destroyers, which is those big guns uh, on each side of the superstructure that basically just point forward. And uh, pretty simple. Obviously, the uh, the Hape and Raid fleet kind of messed this example up a little bit. But the nice thing, too, about having strike cruisers or um, dreadnoughts in the fleet or Carracks or whatever other small ship you have, is that if the battle gets to the point where it is truly like a big scrum, they're much, much more mobile than Star Destroyers. Um, so like if you have a ship back, like say I want to take out this Assault Frigate, which might be out of range of these Star Destroyers, you know, the Dreadnoughts and the Strike Cruisers are much more mobile. Um, so yeah, I probably would have moved this, uh, this formation a little tighter, but just in my experience, it actually does work very well. Um, for Empire at War, especially with Star Destroyers. And if you have a New Republic fleet and sort of a combination of Star Destroyers and Mon Calamari cruisers, it works very, very well. But let's move on. Oh, and as a note, sorry, as that Star Destroyer is destroyed, you have to actively manage ships during battle. I haven't really been doing that because I've been talking to you guys, but just make sure that you always set a target for your capital ships. You don't want them just sitting there like they were there. Um, even if it just means control clicking ships of a certain type, all your Star Destroyers, putting them towards an enemy. Um, if you really want to get into minute detail, it helps to have ships target a different hard point specifically. After you destroy a target, there's sort of like a couple of seconds where it continues to fire on it, um, and it doesn't do any damage. So you want to really be cycling targets pretty quickly. Um, so just keep that in mind. Alright, so the next technique I wanted to talk about is actually one of my favorite things to do in Empire at War, and that is, quite simply, stealing ships. Now, unfortunately, this feature is not available in the current version of Thrawn's Revenge, just because it's bugged out. I'm sure it'll be fixed very soon, and the devs are aware of it. But, it's basically a way to get free capital ships after paying the down price of a capture shuttle, or the down payment price of a capture shuttle. Now, I do plan to do an entire, um, technique video on how this works eventually once it is fixed because that's one thing you guys have asked for a lot if you watch some of my older new republic playthroughs you can kind of get a good idea of how to do it um but for the meantime really the key thing is you want to isolate the most valuable ship so there's not a whole lot at this battle that's worth stealing or that i would go out of my way to steal in this case i would go for the mc80 liberty um but you pay, I think it's $15,000. You can't even build it in the current version because it's bugged out. You pay 15,000 credits um, for a enemy ship, or sorry, for a capture vessel. If you capture this MC-80 Liberty, that alone is like $6,000 back. Um, so you've paid for half of it already. If you capture something like a Star Destroyer, that's like 8,000 credits. So really, you only need to be successful a couple of times um, to really... Uh, to really pay back what it's worth. So there's there are a few key things you need to do. The first is enemy sh or sorry, your own ships will not really listen to you when you say um, don't shoot at something. So you have to make sure that by the time your target vessel is taking fire that you're ready to capture it. One of the best ways to do this is to destroy all nearby ships. Um, and part of this also comes down to intelligence. When I'm playing as the New Republic, my first few weeks are basically finding uh, fleets that only have one or two ships, but um, especially a Star Destroyer, um, eliminating the escort, and then taking the capital ship. And right there, you've basically added immensely to your navy. Um, so some of that comes down to intelligence. Use the techniques we talked about earlier to find out where there's some smaller fleets, uh, especially isolated ones, and then, you know, get that bag. <laughs> 
So one thing I will note too is the last version of Theron's Revenge and probably whichever version fixes the issue with the capture shuttle does also have a little oddity where if the capital ship you're capturing is the last thing that's on the map, sometimes the match won't end and you'll just be kind of stuck in purgatory. You can't even retreat or auto resolve. So if I wanted to capture this Mon Calamari cruiser, um, first of all, this battle would be exactly the one that I would try to focus on. I would destroy all surrounding ships, or at least weaken them quite significantly, with the exception of like, I'd leave, you know, something pretty durable, but not really dangerous, like a, a dreadnought. And then I would just focus in on the, um, I'd focus in on the Liberty. By the time its shield is nearing low, you jump in the capture shell, pretend that this Ton Fak is one. Um, and then I would usually just start, you've got five capture attempts. Uh, I just start spamming it basically by the time the uh, the shields are down. There have been battles where I've made off with like three Allegiance class battle carriers, or sorry, battle cruisers, and I think that's worth like 30 or 40,000 credits. Um, so not only are you taking those ships out of the battle, but they fight for you during the battle, and then afterwards you add them to your fleet. So a pretty great technique. Thrawn did this, as I mentioned, at the Battle of Sluis Van, where he focused on capturing Mon Calamari cruisers and CR-90s and other things. Um, he wasn't really successful because of plot reasons, but um, any ship that you can get without paying for is great. The start of the New Republic campaign also has all of these planets to the southeast. They just have Dreadnought-class heavy cruisers. I mean, not the best ship, but you can use them as pathfinders. You can use them in some of those uh, bait techniques that I showed you in the other video. And they're just, it's just free capital ships. Thrawn wasn't above using Dreadnought at class heavy cruisers. Why would you be? Thrawn's right. One must know an enemy they hope to defeat. So let's first examine Thrawn's strengths as well as his notable losses. Let's get the strengths out of the way. And Thrawn's most impressive asset is his ability to almost tell the future, to analyze events and predict how his enemies and allies will react. A great example of this was when he neutralized the New Republic's feint at the Battle of Bilbringi. He was the only Imperial who wasn't fooled by the New Republic's fake attack on Tang Green. Thrawn's foresight is so extreme that it causes his enemies to second guess both every action that they take and everything the Empire does. Under Thrawn, every Imperial move seems invaluable and every action is assumed to have a purpose behind it. Related is his understanding of his enemies. Thrawn has an incredible memory and absolutely insane pattern recognition ability. In almost every engagement, Thrawn's first move is to identify his opponent. He will then recall past or determine likely strategies and respond effectively. While this does seem sort of obvious and and even easy, Thrawn is able to identify his enemy's likely moves based on somewhat strange factors, like a pervasive culture amongst a species, the personal attributes of a commander, or how an enemy perceives his strength. Often his predictions and his understanding is so far-fetched that his contemporaries or underlings will question his hunches. However, Thrawn is at his best and almost unbeatable when he's able to know his enemy and develop a strategy. This skill is useful for both developing tactics after encountering an enemy in battle or for creating the strategy for a grand war campaign. One of Thrawn's most underappreciated strengths is his creative use of technology and resources. Thrawn makes the absolute best use of everything available to him. During his campaign against the New Republic, he brought the government to its knees with only a very small percentage of the Imperial fleet, less than 50 Star Destroyers in total. We see he uses the ships he does have very well while also gaining an advantage through the creative use of technology or circumstance. For example, Thrawn found the lost Katana fleet and crewed it through the novel use of Sparty clones and the force bubbles created by the Isalamari. He then used Jorah Sabayoth's battle meditation to not only make his forces more effective, but also to coordinate simultaneous attacks across systems and generally confuse his opponents. He used interdiction star destroyers heavily, not only to stop enemies from retreat or to pull them out of hyperspace, but also through novel strategies like the Thrawn Pincer. 
The point is that having a numbers advantage against Myth Raw Nirodo is certainly not enough to guarantee victory. And it's this creativity, along with his incredible foresight and his ability to know his enemy, that makes him so dangerous. However, as I mentioned earlier, Thrawn is not infallible. And what's more, I believe that when looking at his failures, we can spot a common thread. At Bilbringi, Thrawn's forces are surprised by the Smuggler's Alliance, which gives the New Republic fleet a chance to strike back. Thrawn also misunderstands the Noguri and ends up being assassinated by his bodyguard Rook. This was in part due to not understanding Nogri culture and not tracking closely enough Princess Leia. At the Battle of Slewis Vaughn, Thrawn is defeated after Lando uses a device to disable his stolen mole miners. I think the clear trend that we see here is that while Thrawn clearly understands his enemies and spends a lot of time analyzing his enemies, he's less skilled at anticipating attacks or even just the actions of third parties. He really should have anticipated the actions of the Smuggler's Alliance given his brilliance because of his interactions with Talon Card. Also, given the degree to which he utilized and repressed the Nogri and his ability to understand culture, he never should have allowed himself to be assassinated. And really, it's the same at Slewis Vaughn. Thrawn anticipated the actions of the New Republic, he put his plan into motion, but didn't think about how Lando Calrissian himself would impact his plans. So when facing Thrawn, I think it's a good idea to make use of mercenaries, spec op groups, or just forces that he is not aware of. Again, his best asset is his ability to prepare and foresee events. So by withholding information, you have your best chance at defeating him. Now, it still won't be easy because Thrawn can adapt quite quickly, but in my mind, this is one of the cracks in his armor. Another weakness I think would be the general incompetence or I guess more accurately lack of perfection of those around him. Even Captain Pelion was nowhere near Thrawn's tactical genius. We see for example Luke Skywalker manages to escape a tractor beam trap because of the incompetence of one of Thrawn's bridge officers. Now admittedly the man was executed immediately after Luke's escape so the incompetence didn't last for very long. But the fact of the matter is, due to his position as a Grand Admiral, no matter how skilled Thrawn is, by necessity he relies on tens if not hundreds of thousands of people to help him complete his plans. So to summarize, Thrawn probably understands what you're doing with your forces even better than you are. At least your traditional military forces. I still think best practices would be to use some third party. During the Thrawn campaign, the New Republic should have actually paid off the Smuggler's Alliance to help at Bilbringi, because had the group decided not to, the New Republic very well may have lost the final battle. Also take advantage of the fact that while he may not be human himself, those around him are. In 9 ABY, the New Republic was in the midst of facing their first great threat, the re-emergence of Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn had reunited and was now leading Imperial forces with exceptional competency, unifying several major warlords and quickly recapturing territory. The first few months of the conflict saw several major New Republic losses, with only a few wins. However, notably famed rebellion figure Garm Bel Iblis had returned to action and was now stationed on Coruscant. Facilitating Thrawn's rampage across the galaxy was the clone of Dark Jedi Joris Savioth, who was using his force powers to coordinate Imperial forces. However, the relationship between Thrawn and Sabaoth was very difficult at best. With the crazed Dark Jedi more interested in capturing and converting the Solo children rather than reinstating Imperial rule. This came to a head after a failed kidnapping of the newborn twins on Coruscant, and the two men agreed that the most pressing immediate goal was the removal of the New Republic. Sabaoth ordered an attack on Coruscant, and Thrawn agreed. First, as he often did, Myth Ra Nerodo fainted with a fake attack at the planet Mirist. This drew away the core sector fleet which typically protected Coruscant. The New Republic most likely believed that their capital planet, even without the protective fleet, was untouchable. This would be tested. Thrawn entered the system with eight interdictor cruisers, with two more, plus
plus eight Katana Dreadnoughts soon following. Immediately, the New Republic sends a recall notice to the Sector Fleet. However, Imperial forces destroy the sensor relay stations around Coruscant, making any sort of response or follow-up to the SOS impossible. Defensively, Coruscant was protected by two Golan 3 platforms, as well as ground-based cannons. Unfortunately, at this point, the Imperial fleet and the Golan cannons themselves were outside the range of the ground-based ion cannons. Six Star Destroyers would soon appear, splitting up into two groups of three and heading towards the Golan platforms. At this point, the New Republic was launching their starfighters and gunships, and the smaller Imperial dreadnoughts and support vessels were moving to escort the Star Destroyers. As the Star Destroyers entered the Golan kill zones and began firing on the massive stations, interdictor cruisers move up to perform what was known as a Thrawn pincer. They activate their gravity well generators, allowing two Victory Star Destroyers to make ultra-precise jumps next to the weapons platforms where they're able to deliver a full broadside, almost piercing the shields. As this is happening, New Republic vessels are attempting to push back the Empire with no effect. Up to this point, the New Republic's response had been led by Admiral Drayson, a respected commander but not near the tactical genius of Thrawn. Eventually, the role shifts to Garen Bell Iblis, who immediately changes strategy. New Republic forces pull back near the planet, where they can be covered by the Ion Cannon. Bell Iblis knew that they were just wasting ships. Realistically, the Golan Threes could likely withstand an assault for some time, and likely long enough for the Sector fleet to return. Thrawn recognizes the change in strategy, and realizes that Garen Bell Iblis probably just took command. That's fine, he decides to implement his ultimate plan. The Star Destroyers open their hangars and launch 22 cloaked asteroids. These asteroids, which are moved into position with the Star Destroyers tractor beams, begin crashing into ships and enter orbit around the planet. Alongside the real asteroids, Thrawn also fakes the launch of 265 more. However, there's no way for the New Republic to tell which ones are cloaked and which ones just don't exist, because cloaking technology also removes things from sensor readings. So Thrawn effectively blockades Coruscant while using almost no resources. The New Republic is forced to keep the planetary shield up or risk a catastrophic asteroid crash. With the shield up, no one can leave or enter the planet, and there's no real way to quickly destroy the asteroids. This however was just one more step in Thrawn's ultimate plan. He knew the New Republic would now need to find the Crystal Grav Field Trap, which would be able to identify the cloaked asteroids. This all culminated with the Battle of Bilbringi, where he came very close to landing a death blow against the New Republic. So what is Bilbringi and why was there a battle there? Bilbringi, or more accurately Bilbringi 7, is an asteroid in the Inner Rim. It's relatively unremarkable. What's important was the massive shipyard surrounding the planet. The Bilbringi shipyards were a very important Imperial asset during the Thrawn campaign. They were directed by the Grand Admiral himself to build Star Destroyers in order to supplement the weakened Imperial fleet. Not only that, but near the end of the war, they were also home to a crystal grav field trap. CGTs, or CGT arrays, are used to detect cloaked objects. This is something the New Republic needed help with. They were still struggling to take care of cloaked asteroids which Thrawn had earlier placed in orbit over the planet Coruscant. Because of that, and the need for a serious morale boost after a string of losses, the New Republic planned an attack on Bilbringi. The lead up to the battle is actually fairly complicated. Both forces moved assets on a macro level, attempting to hide their true intentions. As they did before the Battle of Endor, the New Republic feigned an attack somewhere else in the galaxy, this time at Tangreen, while secretly targeting Bilbringi. This was all very obvious to Thrawn, who, while appearing to fall for the trap, actually massed a major force at the Bilbringi shipyards. In total, Thrawn commanded a fleet of 24 Star Destroyers, 8 Interdictor Cruiser, 30 Dreadnoughts, and various other smaller ships. This is where things get interesting. As the Empire prepared for an attack, the newly formed Smuggler's Alliance under the leadership of Taloncard was executing their own plan. Using the fact that the Empire was relying very heavily on smugglers for resources, especially electronic components, and the fact that much of the production was actually happening at Bilbringi, the Alliance had a cover for their own massing of ships. Deciding that the New Republic was the lesser of two evils when compared with Thrawn, they decided to steal the CGT themselves and of course sell it to the New Republic for a nice profit. In fact, when the Imperial fleet first exited hyperspace near the shipyards, many of the smugglers believed that they were about to be attacked, but the Empire took no interest in them. 
This was obvious not only because they weren't being shot at, but also because the Empire ships were moving into an entrapment formation. The Star Destroyers and smaller ships formed a fairly unified wedge, while several interdictor cruisers moved ahead to pull the New Republic out of hyperspace away from the shipyard. Before long, a task force including 12 Mon Calamari cruisers, 30 dreadnoughts, and other lighter ships appeared. The interdictors, having successfully pulled the ships out of hyperspace safe distance away from the shipyards, moved back to the Imperial Line which was now advancing on New Republic forces. The interdictors were thus able to stop the fleet from jumping while also being protected by the larger ships. The Empire assaults the New Republic directly, with both sides launching starfighters. The New Republic cruisers, which are grouped tightly together, are faring fine, but support ships are starting to fall rapidly. Leader of Rogue Squadron, Wedge Antilles, realizes that something needs to be done to take some pressure off the New Republic fleet. He wants to somehow attack Bilbringi, however the shipyard is being protected by four massive Golan II defense platforms, representing far too much firepower for the starfighters to attack directly. Thankfully at that point, a member of the Smug Alliance contacts Rogue Squadron over a secret frequency. They develop and implement the following plan. The Smugglers Alliance are being almost totally ignored. What's more, they're in a position where they can attack and destroy at least one of the Golan II defense platforms. They do so, and the New Republic responds by sending at least two assault frigates and likely other vessels through the newly created hull to assault the shipyard directly. This takes some pressure off the New Republic fleet, however things only get better from there. On his flagship, the Chimera, Grand Admiral Thrawn is assassinated by his bodyguard Rook. The command falls to Captain Pelion, who is unable to reassure and properly command the various Imperial Star Destroyers. All sense of battle coherence or overall tactics is lost, and the only option at this point is a full retreat. Thrawn's empire would break up soon after, and the New Republic would move into a position of power. This leaves us with a few questions. What if Thrawn hadn't died? I think the New Republic was fairly heavily outgunned here, and if Thrawn could have maintained fleet stability, even with one setback, I think they would have eventually overwhelmed the New Republic. Not only that, but they could have killed Admiral Akbar. although there was some talk of letting him escape to sow confusion in the New Republic political hierarchy, and just generally continued the massive military demoralization of the New Republic. Another question is, what's the best way to deal with the New Republic breaking through the Golan defense perimeter? To be completely honest, I think a loss of the shipyard, even a total loss, would have been worth it to destroy that many New Republic ships, and had Thrawn survived, I bet he would have at least considered just pressing their advantage. What other options were available to Thrawn? Well, one interesting one that we see in the Essential Guide to Warfare is the fact that the Pentastar alignment considered sending the Reaper, an Executor class Super Star Destroyer, to aid Thrawn's forces. Thrawn was spread so thin at this point, with just a few more ships from one of the various Warlord factions across the galaxy, he probably could have stomped out the New Republic. But there's one question that I've wondered myself, and which I have had asked to me, and that's how would the Thrawn campaign have changed had Thrawn had access to a Super Star Destroyer? And spoiler alert, Thrawn is not successful in the campaign. Could a Super Star Destroyer have changed the tide? This is actually an interesting question that probably would have even been debated in universe because Thrawn almost did have a Super Star Destroyer. When Thrawn returned to the known galaxy, many Imperial warlords and supporters threw their support behind him. One of these factions was Artis Kane's Pentastar alignment. However, as the Essential Guide to Warfare explains, rather than an acquiescence of power, Kane saw this as a temporary military confederation between Thrawn and the Pentastar alignment, so he refused to hand over the Reaper, which was his Executor class Super Star Destroyer, and his flagship. The Essential Guide to Warfare also goes on to state that Thrawn, near the end of his campaign, was about to call on reinforcements from allied warlords who were largely using their ships to defend their own territory so the New Republic couldn't counterattack, and that Artis Kane claimed that he actually was going to commit the Reaper to Thrawn's forces. So again, this is a situation that actually could have happened, perhaps, had a few things went differently. But how would have Thrawn's access to the Reaper changed things? Well, first of all, we have to look at Thrawn's military strategy, and specifically the strategies he was employing during this campaign. The Essential Guide to Warfare says that 
Not having the Reaper would have deprived Thrawn of a powerful flagship, and that I don't quite agree with. Throughout Thrawn's campaign, he really used rebel hit and run tactics and maintained a very mobile fleet. He never fought battles he couldn't win. And even where he was defeated early on, I'm thinking mostly of Sluis Van, there's not really a situation where a Super Star Destroyer would have helped in any way or made a difference. At Sluis Van, for example, he was defeated because his mole miner technique was countered by the New Republic. Thrawn's early actions were mostly raids against lightly defended forces, which he always was successful at. A Super Star Destroyer is not really meant for this kind of situation because it's slow, it's not very flexible, and most importantly, it limits where your ships can be at once. What I mean is that Thrawn would have to basically lose 10 ISDs and their crews just to use this one SSD at least early on in the war. And this reminded me of a prior video I did where Mon Mothma discusses what if the Rebel Alliance somehow gained access to an executor class. It wouldn't be practical for them to crew it, even if they could. Thrawn was not only resource deprived like the Rebels, but was employing a similar strategy. As the Essential Guide to Warfare explains, Thrawn's was a classic variation on the ancient stateless strategy practiced by insurgents for millennia. The New Republic military had to keep every one of its systems safe, or it would seem weak to panicked systems. To look strong, Thrawn had to only stage high-profile raids and evade capture. The rebels had once used the same strategy to erode the perception of Imperial power. Now a rogue Imperial was using it against former rebels. That's at least during the early campaign. Thrawn certainly would have had some use for a Super Star Destroyer later on. We know that Thrawn was seeking to move from this stateless strategy to fighting a more traditional war because one of his main goals was the capture of the Katana fleet, which would significantly increase his fleet's firepower. Thrawn had a strategy for crewing those 178 ships, which he could have also used for the SSD, and that was cloning. It still would have obviously taken time to grow enough officers to supply his ship, but eventually Thrawn would have had enough clones to power the Super Star Destroyer, or alternatively, he could have also used officers from Artis Kane's fleet. If the Super Star Destroyer Reaper is coming, it's also quite likely that they will have a crew for it as well. Again, I still don't think he'll use it early on in the war, but later on when he's in more open warfare against the New Republic, it could become useful. There are really two main options. One, Thrawn deviates drastically from his plans, and two, he integrates the Reaper into existing strategies. I do think he would go to the latter as the Executor class actually augments his plans, but if we're looking at where Thrawn could have maybe deviated from his plans, well, the Reaper could have really helped him up the New Republic's sense of urgency. He could have used it to outright attack major New Republic-held worlds, maybe even sieging, say, Mon Calamari or another important system, perhaps even attacking Coruscant, although with its planetary shields and space stations and ground-based defenses, I do think that planet was too well defended. Instead, I think Thrawn does what he always did throughout his campaign. Campaign. He used the Super Star Destroyer as a puzzle piece. The early Thrawn campaign especially is all about the Grand Admiral finding and securing assets, which he puts together and employs against the New Republic to devastating effect, especially the first time. I'm thinking about, for example, when Thrawn took Yukio. So where does the Reaper fit in? Well, the Battle of Bilbringi. So the Battle of Bilbringi was basically Thrawn's attempt to go to the New Republic into a major space battle. He would trap them there, and with superior numbers would inflict a devastating loss, keeping the New Republic in place with interdictors, and using that to break New Republic morale, and of course to make his military campaign that much more easy. The genius of the Battle of Bilbringi was that the New Republic thought that they were launching a surprise attack on Grand Admiral Thrawn. There were several feints by the Empire and the New Republic, Thrawn predicted all of it, and the New Republic showed up with a force not knowing that they would be outmatched. 
This, I think, is where Thrawn brings in the Reaper. He keeps the ship secret throughout the entirety of his campaign. Maybe he doesn't even crew it, he leaves it in an asteroid belt or somewhere hidden. Then when it's time for the Battle of Bilbringi, it's one major asset that the New Republic is not aware that he has possession of. Then the Battle of Bilbringi comes, the New Republic thinks they're hitting the Bilbringi shipyards in a major strike against Thrawn, and not only now does Thrawn's fleet and the Katana Dreadnought show up, but also the Reaper. So how does this change things? Well, Thrawn's still going to die. A Super Star Destroyer does not help Thrawn with his Nogri problem and with his eventual assassination. That's pretty much set in stone. However, it seemed like the Battle of Bilbringi was very close, with the New Republic perhaps even gaining an advantage after the involvement of the Smuggler's Alliance. I think a Super Star Destroyer at this battle makes it a very clean sweep for the Empire. They probably managed to kill Admiral Akbar and the rest of the fleet even after Thrawn dies, but overall I don't think that changes enough for it to really make a difference. Yeah, it's one more battle that's won, but without Thrawn, I don't think Pelion is the mind needed to launch the campaign, and the New Republic is ultimately successful either way. I think Thrawn probably recognized this, because the Essential Guide to Warfare even explains Thrawn almost did call reinforcements, including the Reaper. He had, perhaps, other forces available to fight for him, but he may have been able to win Bilbringi otherwise. However, without Thrawn, the campaign just falls through. One extra Super Star Destroyer, the loss of Rebel Fleet just does not do enough to tip the scale. In 27 BBY, the Republic launched the Outbound Flight, a colony and exploration ship meant to chart the unknown regions and then travel outside the galaxy. The Outbound Flight was largely a Jedi project and was crewed by 18 Jedi, including 6 Masters. Seeing this as an opportunity to weaken the Order, then-Chancellor Palpatine, under the guise of Darth Sidious, ordered his lackeys and the Trade Federation to destroy the ship. This brought the Federation into the Unknown Regions, and more specifically, into Chiss space. Today, we'll discuss the ensuing battle, which is from one of my top 5 favorite Star Wars Legends books, The Outbound Flight. Now, I highly recommend that you guys experience this without spoilers, so if you want to read or listen to The Outbound Flight, click away now. I personally highly recommend the Audible version, which is fully voiced with sound effects, music, and great narration. The book is available on Audible. You can get a one-month trial and the book for free by going to audible.com slash Eckhart's Ladder. Also, full disclosure, I do get money for every person who signs up, but if you want to support the channel, that's a way to do so basically for free. Everyone else, let's continue with the battle. So, the very sizable fleet, made up of two Lucrehawk battleships, six hard cell transports, and seven cruisers, were detected by a Chiss patrol, led by military commander Thrawn. The Chiss patrol was quite small, with only three tiny cruisers and nine fighters. After failed negotiations, the Trade Federation opened hostilities by launching half of one of the Lucrehulk's fighters. The other three-fourths of the droid starfighters were kept in reserve due to both the short operating range of the droids and the underwhelming nature of the Chiss fleet, with perhaps the thought that more ships would be coming. One portion of the fighters was sent forward to engage the Chiss fleet, while the others remained behind in a defensive screening position. Thrawn moved his fleet back, guessing the operational range of the fighters, while also sending one of his own cruisers, armed with an interdictor generator, to sit away from the rest of his assets. He found the point where the droid fighters could not move forward anymore without losing signal from the control ships, and conducted an experiment. Thrawn had one cruiser and one fighter move briefly into the operational range of the starfighters, then quickly retreat. He did this over and over again, much to the confusion of the Trade Federation leadership. Each time, the Starfighters would begin to engage the Chiss, which would then pull back, at which point the Starfighters would return to their initial position. Kinman Doriana, aide to Palpatine, on board one of the Trade Federation warships, actually believes that Thrawn is attempting to block the communications between the Starfighters and the Trade Federation battlecruisers. However, the Trade Federation leadership replied that their encryption software was extremely advanced. Notably, however, he also reveals that should any any starfighter be jammed for more than two minutes, it will fully self-destruct. Eventually, once this maneuver has been done several times, Thrawn pushes towards the attacking starfighter.
starfighters. The Trade Federation believes that Mithra Niroto has made a mistake and orders the fighters to attack, but there's no response. Now, this is somewhat complicated, but Thrawn had discovered that because of so many fighters, the Lucrahulks were only to use limited encryption signatures. By forcing the droids to perform the same action over and over again, Thrawn was able to dissect the signal, identifying the encryption portion and the command portion. The Chiss responded by sending a counter command, which ordered all fighters to fly off aimlessly into deep space. However, that trick would only work once, and at this point, Thrawn was moving forward towards the ships in defensive position. As the screening ships moved to engage, every cruiser and fighter launched Connor Nets, a missile-based shock net system which outright disabled many of the droids, caused some others to crash into each other, and basically made the force small enough that the fighters and cruisers could take care of them without any losses. The Trade Federation leadership, now furious, orders that the other half of fighters which were being held in reserve by the first battle cruiser be launched. Immediately, before all fighters are able to exit the cruiser, Thrawn begins full spectrum jamming. Now, full spectrum jamming blocks all communication. Generally, it's not very useful against the Trade Federation because they spread their starfighters out and the jamming can only be done in a small area. However, because Thrawn is close enough to the Lucre Hulk and all fighters are launching from the same point and thus within the same area, he's successful and the ships are disabled. The starfighters easily mop up the useless ships with the dust and debris caused by many explosions, causing the secondary laser control systems used by the Trade Federation to fail. The hard cell cruisers then engage the nearby Chiss fighters However, through some fancy piloting and the very smart use of Connor nets, the munitions are disabled, not only allowing the fighters to pull away, but also causing the missiles to collide with the ships that fired them. What's more, Thrawn had identified the same weak spot as Anakin in Attack of the Clones, and the missiles were disabled such that they hit that spot, causing the hard cells to go down with a single strike. Thrawn destroyed the rest of the hard cells in a similar fashion and mopped up the smaller escort cruisers. At this point, the Trade Federation fleet is ready to retreat, but is unable to, as the interdiction technology on the Chiss ship was preventing an escape. It had also now been several minutes since the droid starfighters lost communication with their carriers and were now starting to explode. The first Lucre Hulk, which had been in the process of launching fighters when the jamming began, was filled with many partially activated ships, which self-destructed, destroying the cruiser from the inside. The second cruiser hadn't yet launched its fighters, so it was spared, but Thrawn now had it completely surrounded. Thrawn accepts the surrender of the Trade Federation, boarding the ship to discuss their incursion into just space. So this is obviously an impressive victory. Thrawn destroys an entire task force without losing even a single fighter. What's more, the Chiss didn't even really use droids, so Thrawn was relying on the expertise of George Cardass when trying to figure out how the starfighters would work. It's also impressive because Thrawn comes up with several unique strategies which he only uses one time, constantly keeping his enemies confused and on their heels. By 9 ABY, the Empire was largely in shambles, with the New Republic now controlling large portions of the galaxy and finally beginning to truly build a functional government. The Empire was losing and near collapse, that is, until Grand Admiral Thrawn joined the battle. Thrawn had been working in the Unknown Regions, officially trying to bring the various Unknown Region planets and civilizations into the Greater Empire, but also secretly creating the Empire of the Hand. More on that in later videos, but what's important is that Thrawn returned from his exodus to launch an extremely complex and sustained campaign against the New Republic, a campaign which threatened to destroy the New Republic itself. But it wouldn't be easy, and although Thrawn had gained the support of the Imperial Ruling Council, which itself controlled a large portion of the Loyalist Imperial forces, he had few ships at his disposal, leaving the majority of assets to shore up Imperial borders. He took the Chimera as his flagship, and at most times commanded a fleet of six or so ships, the Death's Head, the Judicator, the Inexorable, the Nemesis, and the Stormhawk. However, frequently Star Destroyers would operate independently, especially the Chimera, while on other occasions of course, like major battles, he would bring more assets to bear. Thrawn's beginning actions were all about testing the New Republic and collecting pieces to the puzzle that would bring them down. One of those pieces was knowledge, and in 9 ABY, he launched a raid against the library world of Abroa Sky, where he discovered, among other things, the location of the Emperor's secret storehouse on the planet Wayland. 
After the attack, however, the Chimera, which was operating independently, was ambushed by a New Republic task force made up of four assault frigates and what the book calls three wings of starfighters. Imperial fighter wings are said to be made up of six squadrons, while New Republic fighter wings are three, at least according to later lore. Regardless, Thrawn was outnumbered, with the enemy probably bringing about 100 starfighters and four capital ships to bear. At this point, Thrawn was still new to the fleet. He was a mystery to his crew and even the Chimera's captain Pelion, but not only was he one of the legendary Grand Admirals, but even during his exodus had a reputation for being one of the greatest military geniuses ever to serve the Empire, at least among those in the know. So let's talk combat. A single Star Destroyer would probably have a decent chance against the four Assault Frigates. Assault Frigates, by the way, are modified and modernized Dreadnought class cruisers. They were about 700 meters long, faster than their base ships with upgraded systems, a lesser crew, but less armor. They seem to be employed very commonly within mobile New Republic task forces during Thrawn's era. The 100 or so X-Wings, on the other hand, were incredibly deadly, most likely capable of destroying multiple Star Destroyers on their own. With the X-Wings considered, it should have been a rout against Thrawn, and Captain Pelion first suggested that the Empire retreat, then later, at the very least, that they call in reinforcements. Thrawn commanded the battle from his personal chambers. On the Chimera, he had replaced a lavish captain's quarters with what was sort of a secondary bridge, which he used to meditate and study art. As the battle began, he was in his quarters as was Pelion, and he commanded the battle from there. Notably, it was at this time that Pelion and much of the Chimera's crew witnessed Thrawn's pure genius for the first time. At the beginning of the battle, three TIE fighters were in a scouting position. Thrawn sacrificed one of these in order to judge how the New Republic commander would respond to threats. Through these actions, he was able to determine that the commander of the fleet was an Elaman, i.e. an alien from Elam. Knowing this, the ties pulled back, and Thrawn ordered the Chimera to initiate a Marg Sable. A Marg Sable has a capital ship, in this case the Star Destroyer, orient its bridge towards the enemy while fighters launch unseen from the hangar. The advantage, essentially, is that the fighters are screened from the enemy, who can't see the formation that they exit in. The typical Marg Sable has them come around various points of the ship and overwhelm the enemy on all sides. At this point, we start to lose the specifics, but what we do know is that the X-Wings responded ineffectually, despite the Marg Sable being a fairly common maneuver. Pelion blinked. What in the Empire are they doing? They're trying the only defense they know against a Marg Sable, Thrawn said, and there was no mistaking the satisfaction in his voice, or, to be precise, the only defense they are psychologically capable of attempting. He nodded towards the flashing sphere. You see, Captain, that's an Elam commanding that force, and Elaman simply can not handled the unstructured attack profile of a properly executed Marg Sable. Most likely what happened is that the X-Wings remained in formation, perhaps heading towards the Star Destroyer, while the TIE Fighters came in on their flanks and overwhelmed them from multiple angles. We do know that the TIE Fighters were described as sweeping around the Star Destroyer, so I think that's fairly likely. Continuing the assumptions, from that point on, the TIE Fighters would have taken the battle to the Assault Frigates with the Chimera in support. The Chimera can most likely even outrange the larger ships and certainly has more firepower. Once one or two are lost, it would be an absolute slaughter. However, the specifics so much aren't the key takeaway here. Rather, this is a classic illustration of how Thrawn operates. He is always prepared for his enemy. That preparedness usually identifies some sort of weakness or common behavior which he exploits. Again, although we don't have specifics, because of Thrawn's study of art or perhaps past battles, in this case, he was able to find that the enemy he was encountering was of a certain race and that this race typically responded a certain way to one type of maneuver. Had the fleet been commanded by humans or some other species, it's very likely that he would have had to retreat or use some other technique. It just so happens that the Marg Sable worked perfectly. 
Star Wars space battles are typically fought within or sometimes at the very edge of visual range, meaning that two capital ships shooting each other can at least see their enemy. That being said, visual information is almost never enough to win a battle. For example, ships may be moving into position from out of range, starfighters are too small to see, conditions may limit visibility, or you need sensor data for your targeting computers. The problem is that by using your ship's systems from active scanning to propulsion, you create a signature which can then be detected by your enemy, assuming at least that you don't have a stealth system which in turn limits your ship's functionality. The same is true for starfighters. If they have their systems running, they are most likely detectable by an enemy. So in most cases, when two ships are in combat, they both have their full systems and sensors running. They can detect each other, and it's a battle of tactics rather than stealth. In Thrawn Treason, However, without unnecessary spoilers, the Grand Admiral finds himself in a situation where he needs to launch undetectable fighters to scout out an enemy. Given our understanding of sensors and the concepts we just talked about, we would assume this is impossible. And even if you launch your fighters, briefly use the engine, then turn them off, they will still be detectable on scopes. Thrawn, of course, has developed a strategy to get around this issue, which I'll call the Thrawn Catapult. So here's how it works. A TIE Fighter, or in Thrawn's case a TIE Defender, is dropped out the ventral hangar of a Star Destroyer, completely inert, all systems turned off, with only passive sensors and basic directional communication systems online. The Starfighter is allowed to drift a little bit from the Star Destroyer before it is grabbed by the capital ship's tractor beam, specifically a tractor beam near the front of the Star Destroyer. The TIE is pulled in towards the ship, but before collision, the Star Destroyer disengages its tractor beam and inclines its nose slightly, enough for the TIE to miss, but to continue catapulted on its vector. Because they're in a vacuum, the little bit of velocity imparted by the tractor beam pulling the fighter in is enough to keep it moving without having to use its engines. Thrawn shows us two implementations of this tactic. The first is in the situation I described above. A Star Destroyer, on the edge of a system, uses ties to scout an enemy and generally to form a complete tactical map of the battlefield before an upcoming engagement. What's notable here is that Thrawn is able to use the catapult while maintaining mostly a dark Star Destroyer, i.e. without giving up too much sensor data himself, as apparently the tractor beam and the slight maneuvering needed can be done while remaining at least somewhat hidden. The downside here is that the catapult won't work if the ties need to traverse crazy distances, it will just take too long. But the upside is that pilots are able to use very simple communication techniques to speak with the Star Destroyer without giving away their position. The second implementation comes mid-battle. Thrawn has the captain of the Chimera perform the stealthy launch during the battle itself, and the ties are able to covertly approach the enemy vessel, where they can then activate and inflict up-close damage. Now the usability the ability of this tactic may be limited, as Thrawn uses it here specifically because he knows his enemy is over-reliant on sensors and instrument data. Others are able to actually spot the fighters coming, but it works in this case. All in all though, it's a pretty ingenious strategy, and it's interesting to think of other ways the catapult could be accomplished without having to use this weird tractor beam maneuver. One would be through an internal launching system, like we see in Battlestar Galactica. Having the fighters launched with with compressed air or whatever else, from the internal mechanism of the ship without actually turning on could be useful. Basically, you would have the starfighter launched, but not active. Also interesting is that this tells us a lot about how tractor beams operate. They clearly can only pull, not manipulate objects freely in space. If the latter was the case, the Star Destroyer could simply sling the ties, instead of having to pull them in, then move out of the way. That technique, for the record, is described as being reasonably difficult to pull off, or at least there needs to be a good level of bridge cohesion. The Outbound Flight was a Republic project meant to leave the Star Wars galaxy and find life and locations elsewhere. However, in the planned trajectory of the Outbound Flight was waiting an advanced Yuuzhan Vong scout fleet. Chancellor Palpatine was very worried that the Outbound Flight would both provoke the Yuuzhan Vong into their full invasion and would allow them to dissect and understand Republic technology. After the battle discussed in yesterday's video, Sidious's aide, Kinman Doriana, put Thrawn in the Sith 
Lord into contact. Thrawn, understanding the risk posed to the galaxy by the Far Outsiders, as they were called at that point, agreed to try and stop the outbound flight. However, another thing that happened was that Palpatine explained that the project was being crewed by Jedi, and he gave Thrawn a basic rundown of how the Force worked. But we'll come back to our Chiss friend in just a minute. George Cardass, who had been spending time with the Chiss, teaching them about the Republic but also being somewhat of a prisoner, pretends to defect and join the Vagari. The Vagari were an absolutely brutal slaver race from the Unknown Regions who were often enemies of the Chiss and especially hated by Thrawn. Cardass presents the Vagari with battle droids, which he claims he stole from the Chiss. He tells the leader that this is only a small portion of their droid technology, which predictably results in the Vagari collecting a fleet and heading off to the Chiss world of Krustai. Back to the Chiss now, Thrawn has been waiting in basically the middle of nowhere with his stolen interdiction technology. Out of seemingly thin air, the outbound flight is pulled from hyperspace and confronted by the Chiss fleet. However, Thrawn is not openly hostile and attempts to negotiate with the outbound flight, even meeting Jedi Joris Sabayoth in person. He is, however, unable to convince the ship to return to Republic space. As a note, the outbound flight was made up of six dreadnoughts built around a central ring. It was crewed by Jedi, who, when in battle, used a form of meditation to fight hyper-efficiently, thus the ship was quite a dangerous target. Again, seemingly out of nowhere, the Vagari now, on their way to the Chiss base, are pulled into real space. The middle of nowhere spot chosen by Thrawn was actually the intersection point of the Vagari and outbound flight hyperspace vectors. The Vagari fleet was huge, it was made up of hundreds of ships and used a despicable shielding technology. The outside of their vessels were covered with bubbles in which sat a prisoner. So basically, if you wanted to take their ships down, you had to first shoot a hostage. This greatly angers the Jedi, particularly Joris Sabayoth, and the outbound flight moves to intercept. The many Jedi use a remarkable mind meld technique, reaching out to the tens of thousands of alien minds within the Vagari fleet and causing a mass, paralyzing confusion. This is when Thrawn strikes. Using droid starfighters that he'd hidden nearby, he makes a run at the Vagari fleet, at the same time activating George Cardass's gift, the droidicas from earlier, all which begin systematically killing the Vagari. Very quickly, dozens if not hundreds of ships are destroyed. However, because their pilots are mostly disabled, the starfighters are able to avoid killing the hostages. However, this plan was twofold. The Jedi had mind melded not only with each other, but also with the Vagari. The indescribable amount of agony, pain, and death is so much that the Jedi too are overwhelmed. Thrawn's very small task force is able to move in to the outbound flight, which is not able to respond. From extremely close range, he knocks out the vessel's cruisers and orders them to surrender. Thrawn calls Sabayoth on hollow, tells him that the battle is over, but the Jedi responds by further falling to the dark side as he had throughout the trip and force choking the Chiss. Kinmandoriana, who had been on Thrawn's ship, responds by ordering the droid fighters to call off their attack on the Vagari fleet and instead make runs at the outbound flight, killing almost everyone on board. The remaining elements of the Vagari fleet retreat, while most on the outbound flight are killed, something Thrawn actually immensely regretted. However, a small portion of the civilians on the outbound flight did survive, and with the help of Thrawn and his brother, were able to crash the ship on a nearby planet. This was actually a relatively big deal, as the Republic technology would have caused a power imbalance within the Chiss familial hierarchy. So not only does Thrawn stop the outbound flight from running into the Yuuzhan Vong, but he also largely accomplishes his long sought after goal without technically having to resort to a first strike, something prohibited within Chiss military culture. Also impressive is that he's able to take one of the greatest strengths of the Jedi and use it against them. In 9 ABY, Grand Admiral Thrawn was waging a devastating campaign against the New Republic. His blitz from the Unknown Region had pushed the nascent government back onto its heels. The greatest of the Grand Admirals initially utilized a rebel-style stateless strategy, focusing on hit-and-run attacks and raids. This forced the New Republic to spread their military forces out across the galaxy. The worry was that with too many undefended attacks, member worlds would lose faith in the New Republic and would rejoin the Empire. However, after capturing the lion's share of the Katana fleet, Thrawn shifted his 
focus to reclaiming territory and further re-energizing the Imperial War Machine. However, to fuel this next stage of his campaign, Mithra Naruto had to secure resources, while also keeping his fleet on the move and striking back against the New Republic. This brings us to Yukio, which, according to The Last Command, by the time of the Thrawn campaign was one of the top five producers of foodstuffs within the New Republic. What's more, Yukio had heavily developed defense infrastructure, including a planetary shield, ground-based heavy cannons, and several large military installations. Anyone in possession of Yukio, with its planetary infrastructure intact, could hold it against all but a large planetary invasion. Obviously, this was a goal of Thrawn's. However, at least according to Captain Pelion and Luke Skywalker, conventional wisdom held that it was basically impossible to capture a planet without seriously damaging the shields. The options were, first, in the case where the planetary shield didn't stretch across the whole planet to land troops outside and wage a drawn-out ground war, or to bombard the shields from orbit, both of which typically resulted in the loss of the precious, expensive, and rare shield generators. Another option was to starve the planet out with a blockade. Even on planets like Coruscant, this took a long time, and Jukio was not only self-sufficient, but a heavy food exporter, so this wasn't feasible. So it's sort of a catch-22. To actually take the planet, you have to destroy that, which makes it so valuable, and the New Republic had the exact same issue when trying to capture Imperial Center. However, if there was any being in the galaxy who could change conventional military wisdom, it was Thrawn and he had secured assets which would allow him to do so. First, over 150 dreadnoughts of the Katana fleet, powered by Sparti created clones. Second, a cache of rare Imperial cloaking tech from the Mount Tanta storehouse, with 23 cloaking units fitted for capital ships. Finally, a clone of the Dark Jedi Master Joris Sabayoth, an expert practitioner of battle meditation. All of this brings us to the Battle of Yukio itself. To keep the New Republic frazzled, Thrawn launched attacks on several planets as he moved a portion of his fleet made up of two Imperial Star Destroyers, including the Chimera, and ten Katana Fleet Dreadnoughts into the Yukio system. Ahead of his fleet were covertly disguised freighters, which by all purposes were simple civilian vessels. However, not only were they under Imperial control, but using tow cables, they also pulled four cloaked dreadnoughts. As the fleet moved into position, the Yukio shield began to close, but allowed a small portion to remain open so that any civilian or merchant vessels could get behind the shield and be protected from the fleet. Unbeknownst to the Yukians, this included the Imperial freighters and, more importantly, the cloaked dreadnoughts. The freighters detached the capital ships and moved to ground, while the dreadnoughts moved into position within the shield, but in high orbit. At this point, Thrawn threatened the Yukians, who refused to lower their shield, but he responded with a genius trick. Using the battle meditation of Sabayoth, he fired at the planetary shields from his Star Destroyer. As the turbolaser blasts harmlessly collided with the shields, through the use of the Force, Savayoth coordinated the efforts of the in-shield dreadnoughts and had them fire at targets on the ground. The timing was so impeccable that it looked like Thrawn hadn't hit the shield, but actually had bombarded the planet, bypassing the shield directly. It took only two targeted strikes for Yukio to surrender, ground-based facilities, shield generators, and agricultural assets intact. From that point on, the only concern of Thrawn was making sure landing Imperial vessels didn't actually collide with the Dreadnoughts. This was important because this wasn't a one-off trick, and he was prepared to use this across the galaxy. However, his ploy worked so well that he didn't even need to. As New Republic and Neutral Worlds capitulated to Imperial rule because of a new feared superweapon. Combined with shipyards which were now beginning to pump out new Imperial Star Destroyers, his portion of the Katana fleet, and his use of Sabayoth, cloning technology, and cloaking, these new military, industrial, and agricultural centers powered the next stages of Thrawn's campaign. In 9 ABY, Thrawn's Imperial Remnant was steadily taking control of entire star systems through the use of blitz, hit and run tactics, unconventional warfare, and secret technology. Today, we discuss Cat Kristak, a planet of little obvious strategic importance, but which Thrawn most likely identified as a staging point for further incursions deep into the galaxy. To say we don't know all the details about this battle would be putting it lightly. The Last Command really picks up as it's ending, so today I'll be making some guesses, especially regarding ship 
numbers and battle timeline. Don't take them as absolute canon, but rather my interpretation of what probably would have happened. My goal in this video will be to fill in missing information and to paint a somewhat clear picture, which I think should be fun. So what do we know? Well, during the Battle of Kat Kristak, at least a medium-sized New Republic force was involved, comprised mostly of Mon Cal cruisers and dreadnoughts. Specifically, we know that Garambel Iblis controlled a fleet of 15 ships, and I think it's unlikely that he was stationed defensively around the planet as his fleet, including the Peregrine, Rogue Squadron, and other captured Katana Fleet dreadnoughts were fairly mobile, responding to Thrawn's movements during the war. We also know that by the end of the battle, at least three Mon Cal cruisers survived. On the other hand, at their most powerful, the Empire had massed over 20 combined Star Destroyers and Dreadnoughts. So here's the assumptions. The initial Cat Kristak command force was likely made up of the Mon Cal cruisers only. I base this on dialogue we get between Wedge, Garambel Iblis, and the commander of one of the Mon Cal cruisers, which suggests that Rogue Squadron and thus Bel Iblis' dreadnoughts were responding to a call for help. So I think this planetary defense force, again comprised of five Mon Cal cruisers, would have been engaged by a mid-sized Imperial task force, including an interdictor cruiser, two or three star destroyers, and four or so dreadnoughts. The composition seems likely because Thrawn would have wanted a force that wasn't absolutely overwhelming beyond any sort of fight ability, but which would challenge the present planetary defense forces. Why? Because I believe his secondary goal was to trap and destroy as many New Republic assets as possible. So the task force jumps in and holds position, the interdictor especially, far back from the fleet where it will be safe. At this point, I think the New Republic sends out a call for help, and Garmbel Iblis's fleet, comprised of 15 dreadnoughts, as well as the Rogue Squadron responds. This is where Thrawn really gets tricky. First, he activates his interdictor cruiser. Now no one can escape. However, there's a second purpose here, the Thrawn Pincer. Space Dock and Star Wars Explained covered this very well in a joint video, which I'll link in the upper right hand corner, but I'll give you guys the quick version. The Pincer uses the interdictor's artificially created gravity well to force ships out of hyperspace. Now, if two allied ships are working together, this creates the possibility for a very exact hyperspace jump. Typically, hyperspace jumps aren't very accurate, but you can very easily manipulate a gravity shadow, and if you know an incoming ship's vector, you can basically predict exactly where they'll be pulled out of hyperspace. So assuming you have one interdictor in place, you can basically perform very exact hyperspace jumps. Depending on the trajectory of incoming ships and the position of the gravity bubble, ships could likely be brought in almost anywhere on the battlefield. Thrawn would have likely had his reserves in very nearby but different systems, which would present him with the most tactical options. With superior numbers, including now at least 6 Star Destroyers and 20 ships in total, Thrawn pushes hard on the New Republic, destroying at least one cruiser as both sides field fighters. One ship in particular, the Mon Calamari Star Cruiser or Thavin, likely pushes to an uncomfortable degree on the Interdictor Cruiser. In response, Thrawn, with incredible intelligence, calls to Two more ships, Victory Star Destroyers, into battle, jumping them within mauling distance of the Orthaven. While this is going on, Wedge Antilles and the rest of Rogue Squadron are caught up in Starfighter engagements. Wedge sees the vulnerable Mon Calamari ship being railed on by Star Destroyers from each side and desires to help it. However, between him and the ship is a Starfighter screen. Here, the New Republic employs the famous Bell Iblis A-Wing Slash. So this is a fairly complicated maneuver, I'll try my best to explain it, but even Wedge doesn't realize what's going on, he thinks Bell Iblis is ordering a retreat. So two or more X-Wings take a lead position, hiding behind them A-Wings who match their speed. If close enough, the A-Wings should be very difficult to spot, both by the naked eye and on sensors. Once the opposing fighters have set their sights on the X-Wings, they break off in opposite directions. The fighters will presumably follow them, at which at which point the A-Wings will reveal themselves, shooting through a newly formed hole in the fighter screen. Now, the enemy starfighter can respond, but it's very difficult to do so, as they will be flat-footed. So the X-Wings engage and eventually mop up the fighters, while the A-Wings take the battle to the victory star destroyers. 
Not only do the A-Wings hit them with munitions, but they also take some pressure off the Mon Cal cruiser, which in turn responds, disabling both of the victories with all of its ion cannons and turbo lasers firing at once. Free from the attack, the Orthaven rushes towards the Interdictor. Thrawn again calls more ships to assault the cruiser, this time Dreadnoughts. However, the Mon Cal cruiser is moving too quickly, and the Dreadnoughts are engaged by Rogue Squadron. With the Orthaven bearing down on it, the Interdictor is facing the possibility of destruction and is forced to shut off its gravity well generators in preparation for a retreat. The entire New Republic fleet, which likely by this point has a set hyperspace route within their computers, then jumps to light speed, barely escaping. However, this is not at all a win for the New Republic. First of all, they lose one of their planets. They also lose several cruisers while not inflicting any serious damage on the Empire. But what else do we learn? Well, Garmbel Iblis has a very impressive military mind, but even his effective tactics were only able to prevent a New Republic rout, not achieve victory. As Wedge realizes departing the battle, Thrawn is just on a whole nother level. This is also a textbook Thrawn victory. First of all, he never shows his full hand. I have no doubt that he had extra reserve ships waiting had the New Republic summoned a second fleet. He also makes use of every resource available to him. I'm sure the dreadnoughts he called in were from the Katana fleet, and he uses technology in very innovative ways. The Thrawn Pincer would become incredibly well known and used by subsequent admirals probably until the end of space warfare.